so I'm just going to say that, you know, we want to welcome Dr. Stauffer, who helped us curate this exhibit. He's a leading authority on anti-slavery in the Civil War era. Um, he's a Harvard University professor of English and American literature and American studies and African American studies. His books include The Black Hearts of Men, Radical Abolitionists and the Transformation of Race, and Giants, The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Um, and, of course, Picturing Frederick Douglass is one of the books that he helped put together, which is a big influence on what you see in this room. Um, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and many other national publications, and he has advised three award-winning documentaries and has been a consultant for feature films, including Django Unchained and The Free State of Jones. Um, in addition to appearing on national radio and television, he has lectured widely throughout the United States, Asia, and Europe, including the State Department's International Information Program. So please help me in welcoming Dr. John Stoffer. Thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> How many of you in this room have never read Frederick Douglass? A few. Hopefully, one of my goals is at the end of the night, you'll want to go out and read him. He is, in my view, one of the greatest nonfiction writers in the English language. In fact, I teach a seminar at uh, Harvard on a virtually every year focusing on Frederick Douglass, and it's one of the main themes. Most uh, English department students still don't read that much Frederick Douglass because they see him as a political or activist writer, and there's still, unfortunately, a gap between an activist and great writing, and which doesn't exist. Uh, you probably all know that Douglass began his life as a slave. He's born in the eastern shore of Maryland in 1818. He escapes when he's 20 years old in 1838. Uh, he has no formal education at all because he's a slave. And when he publishes his first autobiography, The Narrative of the Life, in 1845, it's an overnight almost bestseller. And in fact, he becomes nationally famous in part because of that book. Uh, and that book become, or comes out because he's already a great orator. The 1820s through the 1870s was the golden age of oratory. In fact, if you were a writer, or you loved words, you could make more money as a speaker than you could as a writer. So a lot of writers would actually make their living going on the road speaking and their books, and they would sell their books where they spoke. And Douglas's narrative really emerged because he, when he becomes an abolitionist for the American Anti-Slavery Society, he was such an eloquent speaker that audiences increasingly accused him of being a fraud, saying your eloquence is such that there's no way you could not have had any formal education. No way you uh, had no formal training. You must be, you must be faking it. You must have, uh, you, there's no way you could have been a slave. And when he was on the lecture circuit, he's a fugitive because when he escapes, he's a fugitive from justice. And so he's uh, becoming famous in the North and especially the Northeast because, he is a, uh, because of his speaking. But he doesn't tell where he's from. He doesn't say who his master is. He doesn't want to get captured. And the impetus for writing that first narrative is to silence the accusations that it's, he's deceptive. He's not... He's never been a slave. So it's a tell-all narrative. Uh, and it is one of the most, one, in my view, one of the two most uh, penetrating uh, accounts of what slavery is like. The other one is My Bondage and My Freedom, which is really much more of an intellectual book. It's three times as long. It's published in 1855. And that book actually sold more copies in Douglass's lifetime than any other book. It was truly a bestseller. In fact, My Bondage and My Freedom sold over 20,000 copies in the first two weeks. Um, it was an extraordinary success. Uh, and uh, he was the first African American to publish, uh, or the long, to publish the longest, uh, publish and edit the longest running newspaper. Uh, North Star, Douglas's, uh, Frederick Douglass's paper and Douglass's Monthly from uh, 1847 until 1863. Uh, he was the first African American to meet with and advise the United States President when he met with Lincoln three times in the White House. They publicly declared themselves friends at a time in which friendship connoted equality. And he met with and advised every other president uh, 
uh, until his death in 1895. I mean, he truly was one of the great figures and everywhere renowned as uh, a, a speaker and a writer that one must see. In fact, when he died in 1895, the Chicago Tribune wrote a article saying that, and this is a quote, no man in the United States, no man in the United States is, uh, I'm actually forgot the quote, sorry. <laughs> no man in the United States, um, black or white, has been better known for nearly half a century in this country than Frederick Douglass. So highly esteemed by white people is he that his entrance into their midst upon a public occasion was always the signal for an enthusiastic reading. And that's an accurate statement. The Chicago Tribune then and now is a paper that caters mostly to, you know, it was designed mostly for white people. Um, his stature is, um, is that significant. He was also the first African American to receive a federal appointment that acquired Senate approval when he was the, uh, appointed the Marshal of the District of Columbia and then Recorder of Deeds. He was uh, essentially the ambassador uh, or minister, they called it then, to Haiti. I mean, he truly was a major figure. One of the ironies is that because white Southerners gained control of the story of the Civil War, they either demonized or erased abolitionists. So from roughly around 1905 until uh, 1948, uh, Douglas was virtually out of print. And um, Phil Foner uh, publishes The Life and Letters of Douglas, where he brings back many of Douglas's speeches and writings, but it was published by the communist press, the international publisher, so it only sells about 2,000 copies a year. When I first came to Harvard in 1999, Douglas was rarely taught. Uh, so it's ironic that one of the greatest figures in the United States in the 19th century, someone who was a household name, truly a household name, was virtually forgotten and systematically erased in the 20th century. It reflects the degree to which, in many respects, Southerners gained control of the story of the Civil War and, in a sense, won the Civil War uh, because of the way in which they uh, were able to embark upon this, uh, this act of uh, essentially um, uh, ongoing warfare, guerrilla warfare, uh, and uh, retain uh, or, or through warfare um, overturn the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments and keep blacks unfree uh, until the civil rights movement. And the civil rights movement, African Americans and white radicals called it the Second Reconstruction. This is a continuation of uh, the Civil War. One of the things that you might not know, and it's another aspect of Douglass's significance as uh, someone who used his voice both as an orator, as a writer. He also wrote fiction. He wrote one work of fiction. He wrote some poetry. Uh, but he also understood the representation could take the form of pictures, particularly for the photographs. Douglas was the most photographed American in the 19th century. Uh, there are more separate photographs, separate poses, as opposed to multiple copies of the same negative separate poses of Douglas than of any other 19th century figure. In fact, the, I've run the numbers. The second, number two, is George Custer, who was known as the boy general in the Civil War. Three is Red Cloud, the Native American who was, uh, became very famous in his day. Fourth was Walt Whitman, who also loved photography. Fifth was Lincoln. Now, had Lincoln lived, he probably almost certainly would have been the most photographed American. And an unknown is U.S. Grant. No one has added up the archive or analyzed the Grant archive. So Grant, in theory, could be the most photographed. But Hal Holzer, who is, knows the Grant archive and has written a lot on photography, has estimated that um, there's only about 150 separate poses of uh, Grant, whereas there's now 172 and counting of uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, his passion for photography was similar to his passion for oratory and for writing. In fact, 
Douglas also wrote more extensively on photography than any other American in the 19th century. Uh, and it raises the question, why would a person, why would a man who devoted his life to words and using words to end slavery and racism, he, that's really what he devoted his life to because he understood the power of words, why would he be so obsessed and in love with photography? There are three answers. Uh, the first is that photography was, he recognized the democratic nature of photography. It was the first form of visual representation that was, that was accurate, and Douglas understood the importance of truth-telling, that was affordable for everyone. Before photography, there was a, a painted portrait or a miniature which required upper middle class or above to have the money for it. Drawings were, didn't have the same truth value that a photograph did. And Americans had a love affair with photography that surpassed that of every other country. Uh, and 95% of all photographs from 1839 when it was invented until uh, the end of the century were portraits. People wanted portraits of themselves. They wanted to have themselves photographed accurately, truthfully, that they could then disseminate to the friends, family, and elsewhere. Uh, second reason is, uh, in addition to the democratic nature of photography, as what I suggested, the truth value. Um, and this was at a time in which a lot of racist whites were caricaturing blacks and trying to uh, render them as minstrel figures. Most of you are familiar with blackface minstrelsy. Douglas embraced photography because he knew it countered the idea or it countered the racist caricatures that were so common. Uh, and the third is that he recognized that photography captured the essential uh, humanity of uh, an individual. Douglas, in one of his essays on photography, he did a fair amount of research and read what uh, we would now call anthropologists or biologists or psychologists said about what was distinctive about humans, um, what made humans different than other animals. And he said, humans are all equal in their power of imagination. It, it's what distinguishes them from all other animals. And according to psychologists today, and biologists today, that still holds true. Only humans can imagine a future and think back to the fat past as a way to reflect upon the present. All other animals only think in present time. And that imaginative capacity was important to photography because for Douglas, uh, by photographing oneself at one moment, you, one could go back and reflect on it and see how one changed. In fact, one of the lines in an essay that he called um, Pictures in Progress, he said, poets, prophets, and reformers are all picture makers. And Douglas considered himself all three, a poet, a prophet, and a reformer. He said, they see what is in the reflection of what ought to be and endeavor to remove the contradiction. And that's, in a sense, what he devoted his life to. Um, Douglas had his photo, first photograph taken. This is around 1841. At the same time, he published his first narrative. And it was Douglas circulated his photographs at the same time he gave speeches and sold his books. So he was very savvy about taking advantage of the media of his day. This is from 1841, roughly or, um, around the time he uh, first becomes a public speaker that leads to his autobiography in 1845. And he's, uh, this pose, he is a kind of deer in headlights. At this time in 1841, it's two years after photography is invented, it, because of the comparatively primitive nature of the exposure time in the lens, he would have had to stand even on a bright sunny day for about 15, 20 minutes uh, 
and he almost certainly had a, 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 a brace holding his neck in place so that his head didn't move, so it, was an, so it was accurate. Hence the kind of deer and headlight pose. And in fact, from 1841, it's the, 1841 is really the first year that portraits could become available because of the long exposure time before that. And uh, from 1841 until 1880 or so, or 1870 or 80, most photograph, most portraitists um, used uh, sunlight. If it was a rainy day, they wouldn't photograph because of the light. This is the second known photograph of Douglas. He's experimenting with a pose. He's kind of looking down in a contemplative gaze or pose. Here's a, a third one, which is similar. By 1848, um, he acquires what becomes his signature look from 1848 through the end of the Civil War, and which is staring directly into the camera lens, essentially looking directly at his uh, viewer. Uh, and he always dressed up. He always tried to look immaculate. Just as when he gave a speech, he always tried to go to the venue ahead of time, make sure the lighting is in place, know every detail. Uh, and he practiced his speeches. Uh, one woman who uh, Douglas circulated uh, or showed this daguerreotype at one speech he made. This is actually owned by the Art Institute of Chicago. If you have a chance, you should actually see it because the actual daguerreotype is truly extraordinary. Uh, a woman who saw this image or this daguerreotype said that he was majestic in his wrath, which is a wonderful line that captures Douglas. He's staring down his view. He, in a sense, both his writing and his photograph sent a message that he sought to out-citizen white citizens through the eloquence of his words, through the majestic nature of his look and his suit and his clothing. Out-citizen white citizens at a time in which, many of, in which most whites believed that blacks should not be citizens. It was a powerful message that he sent. This uh, engraving, which was based on a photograph, uh, was probably, not probably, was the most uh, widely popular and widely circulated uh, portrait of Douglas in the 19th century because it appears as the frontispiece of his best-selling second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. And you notice his hands are clenched as though he's willing to face down and stand up and to fight against anyone who would refuse to treat him as an equal citizen. He would also experiment with some poses. Here's a profile look where his fists are clenched, essentially, again, demanding a kind of citizenship. Douglas came to appreciate the power of photography through these two images right here. Um, you might be familiar with it. This is the famous uh, Matthew Brady photograph of Abraham Lincoln, which was taken on the morning that Lincoln gave his Cooper Union speech when he was running for president in 1860. At the time, the Cooper Union speech was very important because Lincoln was essentially unknown in the East Coast. Um, before the speech, a number of East Coast journalists referred to him as Abraham, they didn't even know his full first name. Uh, and, uh, so, and Lincoln, before he had his photograph taken, went, in, went into New York clothier, haberdasher, and bought and, and dressed in the very first suit that actually fit him because Lincoln was 6'4 and his bare feet. All previous suits, his arms were the cuffs or the sleeves went up way too far, his, his, his uh, pant legs came up too far, and he always had a bad hair day in the photographs. <laughs> this is truly the first photograph that makes him appear presidential uh, or as a leader. And Brady describes how he has spent over uh, roughly an hour getting his suit right, getting his cuffs right. He posed him against a pillar so he looks uh, as dignified, and then it gets mass circulated because it appears on the cover of Harper's Weekly. It's really con the 1850s, late, between 1840s and 50s, it's really the birth of visual culture. And when I say the birth of visual culture, it's a time in which Americans, 
started to receive the news visually as much as in words. In fact, if any of you are familiar with old issues of Harper's Weekly, more space is devoted to the image than it is to the words. But people used words and image interchangeably. And this Brady portrait of Lincoln becomes ubiquitous in the 1860 campaign. This is one of countless examples in which the Brady portrait occurs on a campaign button. And Douglas, in one of his essays, in fact, Douglas start, was inspired to write on photography in part because of the influence of the Brady portrait. According to Matthew Brady, after Lincoln was elected, he wrote Matthew Brady a letter, not extant. It, we don't, it doesn't, we don't, it's, if it's either been lost or Brady was lying or something. But according to Brady, Lincoln wrote him a letter, thanked him for the portrait, and said, your portrait elected me president. And in the first essay Douglas writes on photography, he says the, the photograph can elect the president. Douglas himself would appear on, on the cover of Harper's Weekly. Engravings were seen as having the same truth value of a photograph because an engraver would cut an engraving directly from the photograph. And in fact, the Illustrated Press would ignore the transfer process. If you can see, um, it's hard to read, but under, in, in the, the description of Lincoln on Harper's Weekly, instead of saying engraving based on photograph from Lincoln, it just says photograph by Brady. Ignores the transfer process. Douglas, Mo as I said, the vast majority of poses were Douglas solo staring at the viewer from 1841 through the end of the Civil War. Because of the uh, nature, the technological restrictions of photography, there are very few photographs with, in, with Douglas in the midst of what became his most famous acts, writing, speaking, uh, and uh, there are a few, though. This is Douglas uh, giving his the most popular speech in his lifetime called Self-Made Men, which is about the importance. For Douglas, self-made men and self-made women was about reforming. A true self-made man or woman is a reformer. As you seek to improve yourself, you try to improve society. Uh, in the Gilded Age, it started to get change to the idea of a self-made man or woman as someone who rises up to get rich. This is Douglas at Tuskegee Institute before 5,000 people in 1892. And sitting down on the left, the third person on the left from him is a young Booker T. Washington. Here's another portrait of Douglas or photograph of Douglas giving a speech at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in May of 1893. Here's one of Douglas uh, mid or Douglas sitting down at a uh, anti-fugitive slave law convention. It's an integrated community with fugitive slaves, free blacks. His friend Garrett Smith, who's a radical white abolitionist, is gesticulating mid-speech. Douglas is sitting down at his right and will give the keynote address. And here's Douglas in Washington, D.C. at his home in Cedar Hill writing. Douglas rarely used photographs for family purposes. The, Douglas had four children. The only photograph with any children in it is this one from 1853, where his youngest daughter, Annie, sits next to him. And notice how he kind of slinks down. Douglas was very not as tall as Lincoln, but he was over six feet, a very big person. And so he slinks down. So he elevates Annie. He wants them essentially on the same plane. Uh, here's another unusual photograph of Douglas and his second wife, uh, Helen Pitts, uh, next to him with her sister uh, behind them. And this is also another unusual photograph of Douglas and Helen Pitts at um, Niagara Falls during their honeymoon. And this is, this is a photograph that captures what was sometimes common in uh, photographic studios. The facade is false or wrong. Look at um, right here, 
falls. Um, Douglas <coughs> experimented um, on, a new, on numerous occasions. Um, and when Douglas did sit for uh, photographs, the majority of them were just Douglas. This is a beautiful Lydia. Lydia Cadwell was a um, Chicago uh, photographer as well as artist. She does two beautiful prints. And then one of Lydia Cadwell's friends, also a Chicago artist, Eva um, Webster, who later marries and is known as Eva Webster Russell, does a, a gorgeous charcoal print based on the profile photograph of uh, Douglas from the Cadwell photograph. Uh, these are all, Lydia Cadwell was considered one of the great photographers in the country at this time. Cornelius Batty was seen as one of the great uh, photographers of his day who photographs Douglas in 1893. Uh, Phineas Healy and James Reed uh, were an interracial team of photographers in 18, and they photographed Douglas, and he's, uh, this might appear as a family uh, image, but Douglas is actually sitting next to his grandson, Joseph Douglas, and Douglas had given a speech, and then Joseph Douglas, his grandson, played the violin. He was an internationally renowned concert violinist. Uh, James Easton was an African-American photographer and based in Minnesota who photographs Douglas here, and James Presley Ball, the quality of these images, or the, the paper, they've been damaged. Uh, but James P. Ball was considered by the Bo uh, Boston Art Magazine the preeminent photographer in the United States. And James P. Ball was an African-American photographer based in Cincinnati. Photography was truly a democratic um, profession because you did, unlike most other arts, you didn't have to train with a master who was almost always a white man, said, you can't do this because you're a woman, or you can't do this because you're black. Photography, if you didn't need, the barriers to entry were low. You didn't need a lot of money to acquire it. It was like writing. Writing, you need paper and pencil and inspiration. Essentially, that's what you needed for photography. You needed time, like you do as a writer. Uh, you needed to experiment like you do as a writer. And if you had six months or so of time to full days to experiment, you could become a photographer. And a lot of photographers would just put their equipment in wagons and they would go from one town to another, satisfying the insatiable demand. And that's how James P. Ball got him got a start, but he, he establishes a lavish gallery in Cincinnati. Gleason's Pictorial, the art magazine, depicts his gallery as an engraving. It's the before the halftone process, why is to mass circulate an image, you have to do an engraving from it, from a photograph or a sketch. And this is the interior of Ball's gallery. So it's the um, parlor where people sit and wait to sit for their photograph. Their image is on the wall so they can decide how they might want to position themselves. And Ball's gallery was a model integrated space. Photography like the abolition circuit was uh, a, a truly egalitarian space. This is a, uh, one of several Matthew Brady photographs. Douglas had sat for the moat to this day, the most famous photographers. Here's John Howe Kent. Uh, Douglas moves to Rochester when he is during from 1847 until after the Civil War where he publishes his newspaper. And Rochester, partly Rochester because after he leaves William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society, he doesn't want to compete with Garrison. He wants to start his own newspaper. And Rochester was a hub of political abolitionism. He became a political abolitionist, arguing that the Constitution was inherently anti-slavery, calling on the federal government to use uh, whatever methods possible to stop the aggressiveness of slave owners. And Rochester was also at this time a railroad hub. Uh, it was a major railroad hub which would allow Douglas to go pretty much anywhere he wanted fairly quickly to give speeches. Speeches were his kind of bread and butter because that's what made him the most money. <laughs> 
And in fact, um, in David Blight's new magnificent biography of Douglas, he estimates that more people came to hear Douglas speak than anyone else in the United States, with the possible exception of Mark Twain at the time. Here's George Kendall Warren, who was a uh, Boston-based photographer who was probably best known for photographing um, college uh, graduation classes. And here's Douglas at Lincoln's second inaugural. I said Lincoln, uh, or Douglas met with Lincoln three times. The third time is at the second inaugural. You see, I've circled Douglas here. He has a front row seat. Here's Douglas. Here's uh, Lincoln. There's Lincoln right here giving his inaugural address. There's Douglas right there. They have a front row seat. Um, after, this is the, the third meeting occurs after Lincoln's second inaugural, where Douglas is, had been invited to the reception at the White House afterwards. He goes into the reception, and uh, initially there's a, a policeman who says, you can't enter because you're African American, and Douglas says there must be some mistake. He gets in, it's, goes to the elegant East Room, and Lincoln sees Douglas enter, and he raises his long arm, and he says, here, Loudly, and we know this because there's a woman who stood right next to Lincoln who wrote it down in her diary, and Douglas then says the same thing in his third autobiography. Lincoln raises his hand and says, Here comes my friend Frederick Douglas. I saw you in the crowd today. Of course he did. What did you think of my inaugural address? There is no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. And Douglas answered, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. You also see here, and I've circled it in the same inaugural address, I've circled John Wilkes Booth in the balcony, scoping out Douglas to try to kill him. Douglas rarely used props. Um, as a writer, he was, at the time, a relatively minimalist or sparse writer. It was an age of very flowery writing. Douglas got right to the point. It's one of the reasons why his narrative is still so readable. Um, I first came across his narrative when I was 14. It was difficult because of some of the words, but it moves beautifully, it moves quickly. Similarly, as a, uh, sitting for his photograph, he wanted few extraneous props. And when he had a prop, there was, it was often for significant reasons. Here's a photograph of Douglas holding Lincoln's cane. After Lincoln was assassinated, Mary Todd Lincoln gave Douglas one of his canes as a, a token of appreciation for Douglas's influence and their friendship. Here's Douglas with a book at his side highlighting his stature as a writer intellectual. When Douglas moves to D.C., here's his, he's sitting in a chair with the arms carved into a lion, and he lived in the section of Washington, D.C., known as Anacostia, and he was known as the Lion of Anacostia. So the Lion of Anacostia is sitting in a chair with lion-like arms. He almost never smiled, and this is the one photograph out of 172 and counting in which Douglas had noticeably smiles. Why doesn't he smile? Because one reason is that he doesn't want to uh, send a message of the caricature trope of the happy slave. The, the, uh, his life's mission of ending slavery and racism was serious work. Uh, it was very serious work. Uh, one of the fascinating aspects, if you look at all the photographs of Douglas, is to see how much he experiments with his facial hair, which I'll explain the significance of after I show you some of these images. The very first image is he's clean shaven. Second here, he has skin, uh, some uh, chin whiskers. Here's some bigger chin whiskers that kind of go up close to the ear. By 1856, he's got a full beard. Then he uh, it comes down more into kind of a goatee. 
And during the Civil War, he has what was known as a walrus mustache. And Douglas was either at the beginning of a trend or a trendsetter with his facial hair, according to Joan, uh, 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 Joan Severa, who was a fashion designer and did a book on uh, photographs of men and women in the 19th century, using the photographs to describe their fashion. Here's Douglas with a ponytail and a walrus mustache. And then he grows his hair out and his beard out. Then he shaves his chin so he has these bushy, wall, bushy um, sideburns. And then he grows his beard out and his hair out. And this is one of two deathbed, edition, deathbed images. Part of the reason why I've argued that he does this is Douglas's understanding of himself and of what all humans should aspire to is an individual or self that is continually evolving, never fixed, never static, uh, never in a state of um, that is not moving. And you see it if you've read more than one thing of Douglas. Every piece of writing he does, he's experimenting. His 1855 autobiography is very different than his 1845. He's describing a different person, really. His last autobiography is a very different person, and his speeches evolve dramatically over time. His best-known speech, as I said, is his self-made men speech, and the very nature of self-made men evolves over time. The earliest one, he places more weight on God. He was deeply religious. Later on, less weight on God. So Douglas understands the self is constantly evolving in a state of continual flux, continual evolution. And what that he, what the, he understands the self in that way because it explodes the very idea of both slavery and racism. Because slavery and racism are concepts that depend upon fixity, it depend upon a very low ceiling above which some people are not allowed to rise. So if you imagine a self that's continually evolving, that's true democracy. It's true democracy, particularly as you evolve and as you seek to improve yourself, you seek to improve your community. That's what true democracy is in Douglass's life, and it's reflected, I think, in uh, his, uh, in his, uh, the photographs. Um, Douglass's portraits continued to circulate throughout the 20th century and certainly today, and in fact, um, I will, in case you want to know what one looks like, this is a carte de visite. Um, this is the most popular kind of This is by Sam. This is a card of Z by Samuel Fassett, who was also a Chicago ph uh, photographer, uh, which I'll show in just a second. Um, but Douglas's uh, photographs continue to circulate. They become an important visual legacy, inspiring art that could break down racial barriers, as he tried, to, as he did, was able to do in his writing, and his images, and his journalism. In fact, one of the newest. Um, areas of scholarship on Douglas is to highlight how significant he was as a journalist. So, for example, uh, in journalism, everyone is familiar with the lead in journalism. The first paragraph captures the thesis, captures the lead. In fact, in journalistic uh, jargon, it's often there's a saying that if it bleeds, it leads. That begins really with the Civil War. Before that, it was more a belletristic form of journalism, and you'd have to get two-thirds of the way into the article before you knew what it was really about. Douglas's journalism, right from the beginning, he, you know exactly what the argument or the thesis is in that opening paragraph. He's one of the real innovators with um, bringing about this new form of journalism. Uh, Douglas, in many respects, as a f in photography, in his newspaper, 
Um, he took advantage of the new technology of his day in much the same way that activists take advantage of new technologies today, from Twitter and Facebook to cell phone photos and videos. There's been a lot of uh, coverage since the rise of Black Lives Matter describing how many African Americans now won't leave home without a camera. Because although we know in theory that cameras and photographs can lie, manipulate, or videos can, people still trust the camera. That it's not going to, that if, and that there are ways that you can understand when a photographer, or when a videographer will manipulate an image. Douglas's portraits inspired 20th and 21st century artists to create thousands of murals, sculptures, paintings, prints, drawings, posted stamps, and magazine covers based on the photographs to continue to inspire us to try to um, live up to democratic ideals. His visual image protested lynching and segregation. It lobbied for civil rights and celebrated black power. It dignified the black body that white Americans have so often tried to destroy. Let me show you a number of images in the legacy. So this is the Life magazine, which for much of the 20th century was the best known uh, magazine in the country. It, virtually every, many families, most families arguably had Life magazine. He's on the cover um, during the civil rights movement based on an unknown daguerreotype. And there are truly thousands of murals of Douglas. This is one actually a couple blocks from where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it's part, it's Douglas is one of numerous figures um, in a mural called A Vision of Community. Um, uh, it was f uh, part of the King Open School, which unfortunately has been destroyed because the King Open School, they're doing a major renovation and unfortunately murals aren't often seen as art and so the contractors did not preserve the mural, which is a real shame. There are numerous sculptures of Douglas. This one also in Boston is based on the, my, the engraving from my bondage and my freedom. So all sculptors of Douglas, they need a photograph to understand what his face looks like, what his image looks like. Here's another mural from Deborah Browder and Heidi Shork um, in Roxbury, Massachusetts, based on John White Hearn's 1863 carte de visite. Here's the posted stamp based on the facet image I'm, I'm handing around from 1995. And the post, the artist for the posted stamps, I think ingeniously, Douglas's fingers pointing down, they flip the hand up. <laughs> this is one of two very similar murals. This one is in New Bedford, where Douglas first moves after he escapes as a fugitive. And, New Bedford was a whaling community, a Quaker community, and Douglas works as a manual laborer. His first, in the directory, his first um, job, full-time job, is as a preacher. Even as a slave on the Eastern Shore, he started lecturing, he started preaching to slaves, and he becomes a paid preacher in the AME Zion Church in New Bedford. Uh, and this is an anti-racism mural created in 2011. This one is in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Douglas uh, became friends with Daniel O'Connell, a champion of um, Irish independence and democracy. And this is the one that's in New Bedford. So the, the Devaney, Dan Devaney did two murals basically similar, one in uh, Northern Ireland, one in Belfast, uh, and one in um, New Bedford. Uh, here's Douglas uh, by this another muralist, and it's the psychedelic Douglas in 1960s. It was unfortunately destroyed. Uh, here's Douglas in the gang of uh, peace with uh, W.B. Du Bois, Elijah Muhammad, and Malcolm X, uh, in, also in Boston. Here's a Douglas in Westchester University in 2003, a sculpture inspired by the Samuel Miller's daguerreotype. Uh, here's uh, another Douglas from 63, one in LA, one in DC, based on the John White Hearn 
card to visit. Here's a bread for the city in DC. The murals are in virtually every major city, including now the South. Douglas is you know, on a mural at some point. This one just recently went up. It's in the eastern shore of Maryland, where Douglas, in front of the uh, courthouse, um, where jo Douglas was originally jailed in his first unsuccessful attempt to run away. He's captured, he's put into jail, and there's now a statue of Douglas, beside of which is a Confederate statue. This is a very recent mural from Maryland uh, based on uh, the Carl Gears photograph. This is an extraordinary mural, it's, I think. Um, in Chicago, here's uh, a mural um, based on the Carl Gears' photograph. Douglas helped launch one of the great battles in American history, a battle between racist stereotypes and dignified self-possession. He did it with his photograph, he did it with his speeches, and he did it with his um, journalism and his autobiographies. Across 50 years of photographs, he fought for the public image of African Americans as equal citizen across the next 120 years. His afterlife, his visual afterlife, his literary afterlife have fought on. Thank you.